Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course on security technologies. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to go through our CompTIA a Essentials exam, exam 220-701, section 5.2, where we're going to summarize a number of security features, wireless encryption, malicious software protection, biosecurity, password management, locking the workstation, and lastly, biometrics. Each one of these can be used to help make your environment much more secure. And it's important for the a exam that you know all about these different technologies and how they work. Let's start with wireless encryption. We've talked about this before in the course, but it's important to go through the different encryption technologies that you'll find and the ones that you should be using. WEP stands for Wired Equivalent Privacy. And hopefully you're not seeing WEP any, anymore on any of your devices because there were some, real, some pretty significant vulnerabilities identified in 2001. That type of technology is definitely not what you should be using in your environments today because you can really crack into these connections. And even though it looks encrypted, you can then decrypt it in just a few minutes. Very, very, very simple to do. So don't use WEP. You may still see it on some legacy hardware out there that doesn't really allow you to use any of the more advanced encryption technologies we use today. And if you have one of those old devices in your network, you should upgrade that device and get rid of it completely. If it can only do WEP, you don't want it. What you should be using today is something called WPA2. You may see this also written as WPA. WPA was put in place whenever we were trying to transition between WEP and this newer technology that has not been compromised from a cryptographic perspective. So you'll see WPA2, which was built on the same type of technologies that WEP was built on. So in many cases, it could use the same hardware. It was a good middle ground, and it was a lot more secure than having something as relatively completely open as WEP because it was so easy to crack. These days, almost everything uses WPA2, the two we put on the end when we finally ratified the new version. So we had the stopgap in between WEP, which was WPA, and then we finalized WPA, and you'll almost always see it written as WPA2. It uses something called AES, which is the Advanced Encryption Standard, which we found to be, up to this point, a very, very secure encryption protocol. So this has been around for a while. People have used it. They're very comfortable with it. You may also see a methodology called WPA2 Enterprise. The enterprise version of this Wi-Fi protected access is one that uses a master database to provide access to the network. So you have to authenticate with a username and password. So yet another level of encryption. Not only is this encrypted, but you may must also register on the network when you log in and authenticate properly. So you really deserve to be on the network and be able to use it. So don't use WEP. Use WPA or WPA2. You keep that in mind with your encryption technologies. You'll be in great shape. A very common reality these days is that our Windows workstations and other operating systems may be subject to having some malicious software installed on them. So we need to have software that protects us against these malicious types of programs. There's all kinds of different programs out there to look for. They are very similar into the way that they operate and the way they look on your computer, but there are some differences underneath the surface on how they operate. Let's go through a few of these. Anti antivirus, we almost always have to have on a Windows machine these days. And there's different types of things that antivirus software looks for. The first is these viruses we talk about. Viruses are programs that do bad things on your computer. And they start on your computer or launch on your computer by running a program. And it's one that you as an end user must initiate. You must click a link inside of an attachment in your email. You must click a file that was sent to you on a USB key. You have to plug in a USB key and have the USB key automatically run a program. That's how a virus gets on your computer. There's another type of virus people refer to called a worm. The reason we call this a worm is that it doesn't need you to click on a link. It doesn't need you to put in a USB key and have a program automatically run. It's designed to take advantage of vulnerabilities in the operating system so that it can move from machine to machine to machine without you. It does not need human beings to be able to replicate itself wherever it needs to go. And now that we're all connected over networks, these worms use these network connections to move from machine to machine to machine. 
A Trojan is a type of program that pretends that it's something, but it's really a bad program underneath the surface. We see this a lot during the holidays when you may get a program that says, click this button for a wonderful winterland scene or a screensaver that you can install on your computer. And indeed, it may look like a screensaver. It may look like a game that you're playing. Underneath the surface, however, it may be collecting usernames and passwords, other critical information, or simply installing itself on the machine to look for keystrokes that you might type in so that it can figure out your username and your password. All of these programs are really combined, and we really roll them up as virus-type programs. So when you get antivirus software, it's usually protecting against all of those. There's another type of software you might want to consider called anti-spam software. Spam is not a virus. It's not something that will harm your computer, generally speaking. But it is something where you're receiving emails that you did not ask to get. These days, it has a very broad term. People use spam to mean something they didn't want. That isn't necessarily spam. If you signed up for a newsletter and you're receiving the newsletter, that's not spam. You asked for the newsletter. You may be receiving the newsletter and realize, I don't really like this newsletter, but that was your decision. And generally, those newsletters are something you can not sign up for. You can say, I don't want to receive it anymore, and they'll stop sending it. Spam is something that's completely unsolicited. It's done in an automated way. There's no way to unsubscribe yourself from these. And even if you tried to unsubscribe from those, those links are usually just there to see if you're a real person. And if they know that you're trying to unsubscribe to their big spam list, all they're going to do is spam you some more. Quite a problem. There's a lot of software you can install that will look for spam, figure out, is this, this email we got, is this really spam or is this le legitimate email? And then it provides it to you, shows you to it on the screen, or it sticks it in a special folder and says, I think this is spam. We're going to put this off to the side so that it doesn't show up in your inbox. You can watch all our videos online for free, but remember you can download every single one of them if you purchase our downloadable course, which has HD video, MP3 audio, and much more. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website, professormesser.com slash get A+. Another type of really nasty kind of software is spyware and adware, and I sort of roll this up as malware. There are three different types you need to understand for the a exam. Spyware is programs that install on your computer, and they watch what you're doing. They watch where you're browsing. They watch what you type in on your keyboard. They watch what sites you go to. And the spyware usually reports back, or it brings other programs in to show you advertisements or other things on your computer. It can be relatively nasty. Here's one called Antivirus 2010. Stay protected from the latest threats. That sounds like something I want. This is actually spyware. This is a bad program, and it fools you into thinking that you are horribly infected with all of these different Trojans and programs and adwares and spywares. In reality, it's made all of that up. It's there so that you will give them either give them money so that you can say you need to buy this antivirus 2010. You're buying spyware. Or it's telling you that this is something that can clean it up. You need to put this on your computer. And it pretends that it's providing you with antivirus coverage. But in reality, it's watching your keystrokes or it's downloading all of your important files and sending them off somewhere else. Adware isn't quite as malicious as that, but it's oftentimes just as annoying because it's something showing you advertisements. It's popping up pop-ups when you go into your browser or when you're just sitting at your desktop, suddenly ads will appear. If that happens to you, that's not normal. You're probably infected with some adware. Grayware really doesn't fit into a category of a spyware or an adware. Most of the time, it's not something that's really malicious. It's more of something that's annoying. For instance, you could run a program or load a program on someone's computer where every time they try to click the OK key, the window moves away from them. They can't quite ever find the OK key. They can't click it with their mouse because the windows try to avoid the mouse on the screen. It's a great practical joke, perhaps, but it's annoying. And it's something that is programmed that is running on your computer that you don't want to have running on your computer. So in those cases, we categorize that in this category called grayware because it's really not good and it's really not bad somewhere in between.